Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother and Sister Quails, for a wonderful song and a wonderful reminder of what God wants to do for us. Amen. I believe that He does want to revive us. We need revival. We need camp meeting. And I believe that God wants to help us. And I also believe, like a dear friend of ours said, He's helping everyone that will let Him. Amen. Well, it's good to be with you, sort of. I sure wish it was youth camp. But it's still good to be with you, I guess, because my wife is alone. And trust the Lord to help us this week. It's good to be with Brother and Sister Stevens and their ever-growing family. And uh, Brother Stevens preached for us numerous times at our camp meeting back home. Brother Cope has preached there as well. And looking forward to working with them this week, Brother and Sister Quails and their music. Uh, certainly appreciate them. And a fellow from my home church, uh, where did he go? His home church. I'm from his home church. And when we're home, and uh, good to be with him this week, trusting God to, to use their ministry to help me because I want revival. And uh, I, believe that, I believe that God is still in the reviving business. And I feel like that's what camp meeting is all about. Amen. And uh, I, I appreciate uh, Brother and Sister Cope, your conference president. Everybody say amen. amen. Some of them didn't, Brother Cope. Do you want their names? Appreciate Brother and Sister Cope, and uh, I appreciate the, the, uh, the atmosphere on the grounds already. When we first drove on the grounds, and I've already told the caretaker that they look very nice. The grounds look very nice, well kept, and uh, somebody's done a lot of watering of grass around here, and I know it wasn't the caretaker, but thank the Lord for the good rain and the beautiful green grass and the cool temperature. And I don't know for sure what it was, but I smelled some wonderful fragrance coming out of the dining hall tonight. So I think that there are cooks here. And uh, I'm glad that we have a bell for the coat. I hope in the morning to be ringing when that bell rises. <laughs> and uh, I, just, I just feel like we're at camp meeting. And trusting God to help us in a special way. Amen? Amen. Now, what I want to share with you tonight probably isn't the typical opening night of camp meeting. In fact, there's nothing that's going to be typical about Brother Spangler, I suppose. Maybe you've heard me say this before. One of my good friends, I don't know what my bad friends say because they don't tell me, but one of my good friends said, Spangler, if you ever come up with something original, whatever you do, keep it to yourself. That was a good friend. But uh, I, do feel, I do feel truth on my heart and a message tonight. I see the hour is already late. And I want to warn you, I'm not a 20-minute preacher. So let's just get that off our mind now, okay? Everybody say amen. amen. My wife said, but you don't have to be an hour and 20-minute preacher. I said, how about 50? She said, 45? <laughs> and then she told me, now don't say that. When we were singing the congregational song, now maybe, I don't know, maybe you, uh, maybe you well-grounded preachers don't do this, but I do often. I say, Lord, I just need a little nudging, uh, just a little nudging. And we were singing the songs, the congregational songs, and then we sang one of my favorite songs about higher ground. And that's what I'd like to talk to you tonight about higher ground. I want you to turn in your Bibles to a favorite book, Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I know that some of you have heard me share part of this uh, before, but evidently you weren't listening well enough because you're back and I'm sharing it again. I do feel it's a message on my heart. In fact, of the matter is, I just feel like if God allows me to, I preach it everywhere I can go, everywhere that we're at, I preach it because it is the burden of my heart. It's the passion of my heart that God would somehow help us to realize, church, it's time that we get above our problems. It's time we get above our, our scruples and our, 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 our disgruntledness and our bickering and our fighting. I, that's not what I'm going to preach on tonight. I'm going to come back to that, the Lord willing, uh, this week because, frankly, to be quite honest with you, it's destroying us from the inside out. And I pray that God would somehow help us to be able to get above 
some of the little things that the devil is using he's been very successful in using them. God would help us to get above some of those things. It's a difficult day that we live in. There's a lot of challenges around us. There's a lot of problems going on. If you purpose in your heart that you're going to be a Christian, that you're going to serve Jesus Christ with all your heart, then let me tell you, you have signed your name up for battle. If you tr I'm not talking about just somebody who by name professes to be Christian, but if you purpose in your heart that you're going to serve Jesus Christ, I want you to know you're going to be in the battle. There's a warfare going on. It's, it's not an easy walk. And the devil's fighting overtime to try to destroy. God is still on the throne and God is still helping. And every once in a while we get a, some good news back. And thank God when those times come and a, and a phone call out of the blue today came and just thrilled my heart. A fellow that had left the hole in his church and gone another direction. And I told him when he was going, I said, do you realize that your little children will never know the holiness way? They won't know the holiness church or the holiness camp meeting, the direction you're taking them. They won't know the holiness preacher nor the holiness doctrine, which I believe is the only doctrine. And he shook his head and he said, I know, I know, Brother Spangler, but he still went that way. He said, I'm not going to change. I'm not going another direction, Brother Spangler. And in doctrine, there are so many areas where they're very similar to what you preach and what we believe. I'm not really going to go down there. I'm not going to change in my dress. I'm not going to change in some of these other areas. But let me tell you, one by one, they lopped them off. One right after another, they cut them away. My children watched and it, it troubled them and bothered them to the point that sometimes they would say, Oh, Dad, we hope Mom doesn't find out because it would break Mom's heart. How do you think it, it makes Jesus feel? doctrine I said thank the Lord buddy that's encouraging that's rare but that's encouraging I said I'll be praying for you find a good church where you're moving to find a good church get back in a good church and every once in a while there's a good report that comes but I want to tell you often too often are the other kind of reports that come Stand with me. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up on his own accord, or lifted up, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. But the just shall live by his faith. Brother Greg Hobelman, would you ask a blessing on our thoughts tonight, please? seated would anyone else concur with the statement that in the last several years there's been a great falling away have we not noticed one right after another that have come and almost really unashamedly unapologetically they've come and they've said but I don't see it that way anymore I'm going another direction you know and and, uh, and yet God moves in their life supposedly and they have more peace 
and more comfort and more freedom than they've ever had before, but they've thrown aside biblical principle after biblical principle. There's been a great falling away. I don't think that it has to be that way. I know I understand some scripture and I understand uh, some would say, but Brother Spanger, don't you realize this is all part, I just want you to know something. I realize that God is able to keep you and God desires to keep you. And I feel in my heart that if we want to live pure and holy, God has provision and help. The just, that is that humble, that upright one that's referred to in verse number four, who John Wesley said, who, who adores the depth of divine providence and is persuaded of the truth of divine promises, that person shall support themselves or shall exist, shall get up and shall keep ongoing by a firm expectation in the deliverance of Zion. That person doesn't go in their own strength. They're not walking in their own strength. It's not from the strength from others around them. It's not because of heritage or because of the way that they've been brought up. It is by having strength and confidence from God Almighty. And when we start putting our focus anywhere else, folks, we're setting up ourselves for a fall. The just shall live by his faith, not in himself, not in his doctrine, not in the discipline, but in his doctrine, in his word. The book takes the form of dialogue between God and, and Habakkuk and there's this discussion that's, that's going back and forth. And, and when you look at chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, you can see that Habakkuk is coming before the Lord and he's saying to the Lord, Oh God, I've got a burden on my heart and a passion on my heart. There's something that's eating away at me. And he's coming to God almost with a complaint because he's saying, God, don't you see what's happening? Don't you understand what's happening? Can't you, can't you see that so many people are being persecuted and are being hurt and are being torn down? He says, Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Have you prayed for someone to come back to the Lord recently? For a week? Or two weeks. Or maybe it's been an ongoing request that every time they call for uplifted hands, it's your request. And you've prayed and you've prayed and you've prayed. Maybe it's a lost son or a daughter. Maybe it's a previous pastor or just a dear friend. But you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you see no results. Sometimes you just feel like saying, Lord, what has to happen? How, how can they come? What, what has to take place? What has to transpire? A lady that I pastored for 17 years, Grandma Ferguson, Sister Valerie Quayle's grandmother, she used to say to me as a young pastor coming into church, she'd say, Brother Spanger, it's exciting. God's working. And as a young pastor, sometimes I would say, well, that's good, Sister Ferguson, but where? I'm just being honest because there were all kinds of problems and all kinds of battles and all kinds of waywardness and all kinds of worldliness. And I would have to say sometimes, Sister Ferguson, where? But she'd say, Brother Spangler, God's working. God's moving. Even when we don't see him. And then when God would move and God would come on the scene and someone would come back to him or someone would make their way to him or an altar service, Sister Ferguson would be the first one naturally rejoicing and all of the rest of us wimps would get on board and rejoice too. But she was expecting God to move. Habakkuk is expecting God to move. And that's why he's saying, Lord, how long do I have to cry out to you in the midst of all this turmoil and these problems and these battles that are taking place? Did you ever find yourself grumbling at our government? I didn't vote for him. Reluctantly, I voted for the other guy. It was a terrible thing. I sure wish. I thought about it. I sure wish I'd have 
voted for Brother Cope. I mean, our, things are changing so quickly in America, I don't even want to go there. That's discouraging. Things are changing so quickly. In, set up for one day and take notice of the news. So much turmoil, so much corruption. And the news media, they laugh and they mock at it, and so the people laugh and mock at it. We look sometimes at our leader like Habakkuk was. Habakkuk was looking at the leaders. He was saying, God, how long do these Chaldeans get the upper hand on your people? They're more wicked than the worst of the Jews. How long are you going to let them have the upper hand? And he's complaining to God. I've complained that very complaint to God concerning some folk in Washington. I've said, Lord, how long are you going to let this, sit, this thing develop? How far is it going to go? I, I, I want to be prepared. I've told my three children. I've encouraged them. I said, cheer up. It's going to get a lot worse. Habakkuk's complaining about the government having an upper hand on the church, God's people. That's cause for complaint. I've complained about a few other things to the Lord. I've said, Lord, how long are you going to allow these that are corrupt to be leaders in the church? How long are you going to allow these that are corrupting the doctrine and removing the landmarks to be leaders in the church? And nobody wants to confront, nobody wants to deal, nobody wants to go to them. Oh, I know we like to sit around and talk about them. Sometimes it burdens our heart to say what's happening to our churches. Thank God for Brother Cope. I wrote a song about you, brother. I'm not going to sing it tonight. Just relax. He's as nervous. Oh, he's never nervous. He's just plumb scared what Brother Spanger's going to do. But just relax. But you keep coming back. One of these nights I'm going to sing a song. It's a beautiful song about Brother Cope. Maybe Brother Stevens and I will sing a duet. Thank God for good godly leaders who are taken the way. But sometimes it's a burden and a challenge to our heart when we see so many that are just throwing everything aside and yet nothing has changed. Everything's still the same. There's a burden on Habakkuk. Oh Lord, how long shall I cry and thou will not hear? Even cry out of violence and thou will not save. You see, the day as far as Habakkuk was concerned was all wrong. Where was God when you needed him most? Did you ever feel that way in your life? I'm just asking. Have you ever felt that way? Have, have you ever had everything, the cart, along with all of the apples and the entire orchard? Have you ever had it all upset? Everything around you in your life just torn to sunders? And nothing left? I mean, you thought you had everything in order and everything there and, and all of your support and everything was concrete and everything was factual, but the next thing you know, a storm comes by and it literally destroys everything around you. And you're standing right in the middle of all the comfort, I don't know, maybe home or vehicles or family, church leaders, whatever the case might be, but you had it all around you and you felt quite comfortable. Everything was going hunky-dory. And then a storm comes. And it doesn't just take one or two items. He wipes everything out. And there's nothing left. Except the just shall live by his faith. So right in the midst of it, when everything's gone, when your best friends... The closest to you have turned and gone another direction. Everything around you, maybe family as well, it's all of a sudden gone and there's no more supports anywhere. 
Have you been there? I want you to know in the midst of that, on that flat plain when there's nothing else around for support, I want you to know God still is. God still is. I thank God for family. I like family. We all have Verizon. Mine's off, by the way, tonight during service. But we all have Verizon. We like Verizon because they, they spy on you and give everything to the government. <laughs> Can you imagine President Obama tonight sitting in his office with a big computer screen watching me pace back and forth? I like Verizon because we can all keep in touch with each other, my whole family. I don't feud with my sisters and my brothers. You can say amen because they might be here. Yours might be. I like to be able to call and not get charged and talk forever, however long you want. I like my family. I thank God for my wife. I thank God for my children. Because in the midst of the storm, when everything was being all torn up and dad was a little shaky, I had three children that were praying for dad, saying, hold on, dad, hold on. And I thought, Brother Cope, I thought in a matter of moments, everything that I have built in them, trying to tell my children that God is able, God is able, God is able, even when you don't have, God is able. Even when you can't see, God is able, when you can't hear, God is able. And I've tried to tell them that and tried to, and now all of a sudden, here we are and everything's gone. I'm not talking about my house. It's been gone for a long time. I'm still looking for my first one. But I'm talking about things that are very dear to you and all of a sudden just vanish. Thank God for some children. They could get on one side and on the other side and lift your arm up. I have three children. <laughs> and something came over me and it said, you cannot fail. You've got to stand. Sure you're in the battle. Sure the devil's mad. Sure things are tough. Sure things are hard. Sure you have no one else to turn to. But you have God. You have God. You see, Western Asia was being mopped up by the Chaldean army. And Habakkuk had hoped and Habakkuk had preached and Habakkuk had, had taught that God would come. He declared that God would come with swift and miraculous power and that God would come and fix everything. That's what Habakkuk told him. God will come in and God will step on the scene and God will make all the wrongs right. God will take care of it. But it wasn't happening. In fact, you can look at chapter 1, verse number 5. And you'll see there's the promise. God said, Habakkuk, you just hold on. I'm going to do a work so big that even the heathen, even the heathen wouldn't believe it. I mean, nobody will believe it. You wouldn't believe it even if I told you I'm going to do a work amongst you that you wouldn't be able to understand if I explained it all to you. Don't you love when God works that way? But that's chapter 1, verse number 5. Go to the end of chapter 1, and everything's happening just the opposite. God's not stepping on the scene. God's not working in the scene. God's not moving on the scene. In fact, of the matter is, things were much, much worse. You can read it there toward the end of the chapter. People were treated more or less like fish. Scarfed up, screwed aside. Captured in the nets, screwed aside. Now, when I get into the, to the story like that, and, and I read a story like that, I, it, it, it bothers me because I know that God is big. In my heart, church, I know that God is big. I know that God is able. We sing that to the children. We sing, my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. They sing about tonight, there's nothing impossible. It's true. God is big. And yet there are situations and, and things that happen sometimes in our life where we have to question and say, where's God at? Where's God at in the midst of this storm? 
God still is. God still is. Back in the back in the 19 back in 1960s, mid 60s, somewhere it was in New York, Albany, New York, on the campground there, right around it was conference time. Session was on. Brother A.J. Whitney was up on the platform. Brother A.J. Whitney told me this story himself numerous times. He said, "Brian, we were facing a storm." It wasn't from within the church. It was from without the church. It was, be, it was pressure being put on them. We we're facing a storm. And he said a lot of our people were getting discouraged. And a lot of our people were saying, where's God in all this, Brother Whitney? And Brother Whitney, from the, from the platform, he called on Brother Wayne States. He said, Brother Wayne States, could you come and could you, could you sing a special for us? Could you come to the desk? Could you sing till the storm passes over? And Brother Wayne States got up. He was seated on the center aisle. He got up. He walked up to the front. He walked over to Brother Whitney. Walked over to the desk. And he said, Mr. Chairman, he said, with all due respect. <laughs> and we want to focus on the storm getting over. Or we want to pray and say, God, get me out of this storm. But God was working out his purpose that even Habakkuk didn't see. God was sifting out. I mean, really, God was sifting out the right, the righteous, the holy, the pure from the others. I don't know, to be honest with you, I don't know what all's happening in our church all across our land. But I do believe there's a sifting going on. And I'm ever grateful that there are the pure and the clean. Habakkuk's situation, Habakkuk's uh, story, as it begins to unfold, it kind of, it, it, maybe it doesn't do you this way, but it does Brother Spangler this way. In fact, my wife says when she has her devotion, the last time through the Bible, she said every time that God said God was going to do something, she marked that. She put a highlighter and marked that in her Bible. And whenever God came through and did that, she marked it. She came to the conclusion through the whole Bible, God always does what God says God's going to do. She came to that conclusion. Have you come to that conclusion? Go to chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Chapter 3, and the last two verses. Here's the conclusion, the end of the story. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and He will make my feet like hind's feet and will make me to walk upon mine high places. Did you hear the end of the story? The end of the story is... God is going to make my feet like hinds feet and get me up on top of my problems, my battles, the storm, the situations. Brother Spangler, what are you talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I hope you love me. But folks, we're facing a far greater storm than the electronic devices that you can buy at Walmart. I don't have them, but I'm telling you, we're facing a far greater storm. We're facing a far greater storm than all of the things that we're getting tangled up on. The enemy of our soul is our storm, and he's endeavoring to destroy. And if you're not buying one of these, or you're not owning one of these, or you're not having one of them, let me tell you, that does not exempt you from the storm if you're trying to live your life for God. And the devil will have something else. He'll have another way. And he will work and whittle and whittle and whittle until you might have everything in your life lined up one item after the next. You might line up to this book cover to cover. And you ought to. Let me assure you, it will not be long until the devil 
will be working somewhere to devise a storm. It won't be long until we'll be in warfare. My wife and I feel like we ought to tighten our belt. I've told my children. I said, listen, guys, there's some things we can get along without. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need them. We don't have to go. We, there's some things we can get along without. I said, we need to tighten our belt. We're getting closer and closer to the end. We need to be more careful today in our living. But you know when you start making statements like that and you start making a focus like that in your spiritual walk, do you know the devil catches on? And the first thing he does is he starts working in an area that you never thought of, but he did. And it's sorry and it's sad, but many people fall right there. I feel like God wants to help us through. I feel that way in my life. God wants to help us and, and God wants to carry us through. And I, I feel like you and I, the just, shall live by their faith, by their confidence in God. And that God wants to help us through. But sometimes I get to the place in, in life, just in everyday life, where I start to say, God, can you come and help now? Can you fix this now? This is tearing us apart. These are good people on both sides. And the devil's got a wedge and the devil's got an issue. And he's driving them apart. He doesn't start out with bitterness. We identify bitterness and we say, oh, we know what that is, devil. I don't want... But he starts out with something smaller. Until it starts to happen. And sometimes I just... Pray, God, please, please somehow bring all this to naught. Help the devil's plans here to all fall apart. So when I read Habakkuk's story, I jump to the end of the, of the book. You've probably heard me say that, that before because that's my personality. I don't like suspense. I don't like suspense. Sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I don't, like, I don't like a good mystery book. I don't like a bad mystery book. I don't like suspense. I want to get to the end, and I want to say, okay, here we are in the storm, Mr. Habakkuk. God said he's going to help, but he's not helping yet. Let's run up here to the end, and let's just make sure. And we do, and he does. And, you know, I think about the end. I think about the other end of the book. It's encouraging to me. Sometimes in life's battles and in the struggles, sometimes we have to remind ourselves. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light or of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. We have the end of the book if we stay just in our hearts. The just shall live by faith. The Habakkuk situation was chaotic. And it was destruction. And it was trouble. And it was horrible. Habakkuk just didn't realize that God was going to deal with the Chaldeans in his time. Nebuchadnezzar and the monarch and, and monarchy and all of it. All of their usurping their authority to build everything off of the backs of the people. God was going to deal with all of it. But in God's time, God was going to deal with it. Can I remind you that God knows what God is doing even when we don't? I just have to tell myself, most of the time I don't know. Most of the time I don't know. So every once in a while I run to the end of the book. 
Say, God, I don't know how you're going to fix all this or straighten all this out. But I know you want to. And I know that if we stay pure in our heart, I know that you'll help us. We look at Habakkuk for an example. In the midst of, of mind-boggling, heart-wrenching, reason-defying turmoil. When he could not see and he could not understand. And he could not hear and he could not comprehend. When he knew nothing else to be concrete. Because everything had been wiped. Everything had been changed. Everything that he preached. Everything that he talked about. None of it was happening. But Habakkuk still knew this. God is. God is. And he said, I'm going to get up. I'm going to watch. He said, I'll set me upon the tower and we'll watch to see what he will say. It's as if he was saying, I will look up. I think that he was saying, I will look up. I'm not going to look around. I'm going to look up. I'm going to get myself. I'm going to pick myself up by the nap of the neck and I'm going to get myself up above my problems and look to God. I'm not going to stay down here and struggle in all the turmoil and all the mixing things that are happening in our, because they're happening not only in the world but in our church. And sometimes they come one right after another. My boy said to me the other day, I was sitting in my recliner, my lazy boy. Every preacher should have a lazy boy. I was sitting in the recliner, had the, had the gear shift pulled back. I was relaxing. My boy, Brian, he's just as, he is as calm as a cucumber. They're riding down the road one day and the coach, the bus caught on fire. I mean, flames, fire. And he simply says to my boy, Kevin, who's more like his dad, he says to Kevin, he says, hey, Kevin, look, there's, it's on fire back in there. And Kevin's like, we'll do something. And he goes and gets the, the thingy-majigger. We were remodeling a house one time, and, and my boy, Brian, we, we, we were burning some wood in the old fireplace there while we were remodeling. It was on, on, the only heat we had up on the lake. And, and we were remodeling this house, and, and Brian comes by one day and says, Hey, Dad, you know there's fire back in here behind the wall? I said, Well, get water! And so the other day, just last week, was it, honey? Last week, my boy comes walking out of the back room into the living room where I was seated in the, my recliner. And he says, hey, Dad. He said, we don't have to go to the creek to go fishing. We got, we got a river running right across the floor. I said, what? I flipped the lever, jumped up, ran around, grabbed the shop vac, started sucking up water. I said, boys, grab two shovels, go outside and start digging trenches away from the house. We're going to be flooded. My shop vac is 16 gallons. I emptied that thing five times. It was a flood. I ran that crazy thing and ran that crazy thing until the little bulb up in the top would stop and I knew it would be full. I could hardly lift it. I'm not as robust as some, Brother Stevens. I could hardly lift that thing. My wife said, let me help. I said, no, you get back. I didn't want her to show me up. But I dumped that water in there and I went back and I'm going to tell you something. It was just a coming through. I mean, it was coming through. They said we got three inches of rain in, in an hour and a half. Well, it felt like we got 23 inches of rain in a minute and a half. I was sucking up that water, sucking up that water, filling up that thing, dumping it over here in the, in the basin, turning around. I was just coming in, coming. And the next thing I know, it starts coming in over here. And then it's coming in over here. It's coming in all over the place. And then it starts coming through the roof. And I holler for my wife, honey, get the buckets. But we like it there all right. <laughs> Do you know, have you ever felt that way in your spiritual walk, in life in general, in the church? That it just seems, Brother Cope, like it's just rushing in from all directions. And you feel like getting over here and you feel like saying, okay, we got a problem. And you feel like dealing with this issue, but while you're dealing with this issue, it's coming in over here. And it's coming in over here. And the next thing you know, it's coming through the roof. And it's all around us. And you work your hardest and it just feels like it's still getting the best of you. Maybe it is. Maybe it's getting the best of us. 
because maybe we are focused too much on the things around us that are happening. I don't know. I throw this out. These are thoughts that I've been meddling with. Maybe, maybe it's time to, to get a hold of God. Maybe it's time to get above the circumstances around us. I'm not saying we ignore them. I'm saying we go to the source that's able to take care of them. Thank God he's on the throne. I'm trying to, I, I'd like to just stand still and preach quiet tonight. But I had a little bit of Nesquik. And that's all I need. <laughs> but does it sometimes challenge your heart? Come on, does it sometimes challenge your heart? When you hear about another preacher that's fallen in a trap that was so easy, easily avoided, could have been so easily avoided, but he fell. And then another, and another, and another, until my wife and I say it doesn't surprise us what's going to happen next. Just one right after another. Good people got people who had two works of grace. I'm not talking about people who were fooling around the fringes and never really got settled. Maybe that's part of it, but I'm telling you, some of them were good people who still fell. If you weren't able to fall, the devil wouldn't waste his time trying to get you to. Sometimes, Brother Cope, it's a little discouraging. To me, to me, it's a little discouraging. And so I've been praying. God, what do we have to do to combat this? We can't afford to lose anymore. What do we have to do? Maybe we'll come back to that thought, but one of the things later in the meeting, but one of the things we have to do is we have to focus on Him. We have to focus on him. We have to get to the high place. We've got to make it, folks. We can make it. God wants to help us. When we're tossed about and we're attacked on every hand and things are going the opposite from the way the, the, our plans and our desires, may we still pray and pour out our hearts and our burdens and our petitions and our sorrows and yes, even like Habakkuk, our complaints. And God help us to, to get to the high place with a holy heart. He said, the just shall live by faith. With a holy heart, as a godly person, not somebody fiddling around the fringes, but somebody who's living carefully as God's word designs and declares for them to live. Holy heart. With a humble cry, can we get to God? Say, God, we need your help. Our families need your help. Our churches need your help. I just think sometimes we have to, we have to move away from the, from the horizontal happenings, folks, and get a vertical expectancy. To say, God, help our churches. Help the connection. Help the Allegheny Wesleyan Methodist Church. You might not realize it, but I'm one of you when I'm home. That's where I go when I'm home. I like going to the Allegheny Church. You can hear what's going on. Some of you got that and some of you do it. I thank God for the Allegheny Conference. You have a lot of good preachers in your conference. Say amen, preachers' wives. You got a lot of good preachers. You got a lot of good churches. Thank God. But the devil's on the war path. The devil's on the war path. We must choose to trust and choose to climb. I believe God wants to help us, church. I feel like he does. When I was out in the... In the when I was, I don't have time to tell that tonight. Can I? Are you in charge? Thank the Lord. 
when I was out in the, in the Bob Marshall several years back. And we were way, way out in. No cell phone signal, no, le no nothing except horses. We had food. Way back in there, 29 miles back in on horseback. Every morning, up in the morning, early in the morning, before daylight, we'd get our breakfast and eat our breakfast and saddle our horses and scabber our guns. And off we would go to ride, looking for... <laughs> and miles and miles and we were glassing and looking for elk I had two Amish boys with me the Amish boys were there was a big rock ledge right in front of us several hundred feet straight drop sheer cliff and two boys were sitting right here with their feet dangling over with their glasses looking for elk I have two sons I was to be watching these two Amish boys 16, 17 years ago I said guys can you come back here? Can you come back here and lay on the rock here? And then you can still see. Look, I can see. They turn around. They said, Bishop, are you nervous? I said, yeah. They said, no problem. What they just, I was like, oh, they were going to fall. But they didn't. And when they got home, they made my wife a sleigh bed. And we got back and we were glassing and we were looking. And we were all the way up on the top. It's hard to explain unless you've been there. But we're all the way up on the top. We're looking down on everything. Sort of. Way across. We could see other peaks over there. Our horses, we tied back behind us. And we're just glassing, looking, looking. And all of a sudden, I look to my left. And there's another big rock over here to my left. It's a big rock. And another rock up on top of it. It's shaped just like this right here. Just like ladies used to do their hair. It's like that. It's all right, ladies, if you do your hair that way, but don't let a goat get up there. Because right up on top of the top highest point of that rock, right next to us now, it's like right there. Some of you looked. It's not there. That's the tabernacle. But I'm saying it's right. It's like it's right there. And there's this, there's standing pure white, pure white, long hair. They're standing right there with black beady eyes. And like some of you have. And, and black horns. Likes. Like you don't have. But these black horns, and it's look, and it's standing up on top of this rock, looking at we had high-powered rifles. And it's standing up there chewing its cud. Looking at us. I can't stand the thought of chewing a cud. But there he was, chewing his cud. And I said to the guy, the boys, I said, boys, look right there, look. And they looked, we didn't have tags, but we had cameras. And we took pictures, got beautiful pictures. And as we admired that thing for a little while, we began to notice how in the world did it get up there? How did that mountain goat get up on top of that rock? And Matt, chef, our guide, said, Preacher, haven't you ever heard of Heinz feet? Yeah, yeah. Heinz feet, you know, when we were kids and we'd go to, we'd go to McDonald's. We'd take the little ketchup packet, put it on the floor, somebody would walk by, step on it, squirt it on them. We'd say, Heinz feet. <laughs> Haven't you ever heard? Of Don't do that, by the way. The ketchup packets are big now. They're big. I said, yeah, yeah, I heard of Heinz feet. He said, well, that goat's got Heinz feet, and he can get up there. And then he preached me a sermon. I'm going to preach it to you. He said, you see where that, where that goat is up there? And the goat's still chewing its cud looking at us. He said, the grizzly can't get him up there. There were grizzly bear, by the way, in the Bob Marshall Wilderness where we were. 
I saw, I got pictures of footprints with my big size 14 next to it, and it looks like I got little feet. He said, the grizzly can't get up there. He can't pull his weight up. The way that rock is, he can't pull his weight up there. That's the way I feel a lot of times. He said, the wolves, they were there too. They came through our camp. He said, the wolves, they can't get up there. He said, the wolves will work together in packs. And he said, they'll put their forepaws up on the rock. And he said, other wolves, 200-pound wolves. He said, other wolves will literally run and try to run up their back to get up there. But he said, they can't get there the way the rock is. And he said, the long-tailed cougars, they were there too. Not little kitty cats. Tails three feet long. He said, they can't get there. Because he said, when they jump, he said, they have to build momentum to jump again and momentum to jump again. They have to spring. But he said, the mountain goats got special feet. This was a good lesson out in the Bob Marshall. Expensive, but I didn't pay for it. He said, he said, the mountain goat has special feet. And he said, the mountain goat, when he jumps and his feet touch, he can immediately jump again and his feet will grip and he can jump again and he can get to the top. He said none of the other animals can get to him up there. And that's why he feels so safe seeing us animals. Now, folks, uh, the scripture talks about that. Sure, there will be bears and wolves and lions, and many will fall prey and will be destroyed. But God hath made a way of escape if we run to the high place. Remember Ezekiel? Like the roaring lion ravening the prey, they have devoured souls. Like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls. I cannot identify all the tactics of the enemy nor all the hounds of hell that he would like to seek on our soul. But I can tell you, he's on the warpath. And I can also tell you, you're not strong enough to combat him on your own. But I want you to know God will give you feet. The pure in heart, God will give you feet like hind's feet. And he'll help you that in the midst of the storm, when it's so difficult and so challenging and so destructive in your life, God will help you to be able to get above it all and get up on top. God will help you to be able to get up there and chew your cud for whatever it's worth. God will help you to be able to get up there and look down on the battles and on the storms and on the problems and on the compromise. God will help you to be able to look down, but it won't affect you. But it's not what we can do, folks. It has to be God. I feel this way in my heart as we analyze what's happening across our movement and across our land. It's happened to a lot of good people. But it need not happen to any more. That's the way I feel in my heart. I feel like God wants to help us if we'll let him. But if we just continue to go on and say, oh, now, Brother Spangler, that, that doesn't trouble me. That doesn't bother me. That's happening here, I know, but it doesn't bother me. We'll be the target. God could somehow help us to say, Lord, we can't do this on our own. We need your help. I feel this way that God wants to help us. Fact of the matter is, I felt just recently, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask. Say, God, can you come and help me? I'm in the midst of a battle, in the midst of a storm. People are going down all around me. Can you come and help me? 
Shall we stand? I pray that God will help us this week. I pray that God will help us to keep our attention on Him. To keep our focus on Him. I share this little thought in closing before we go. It's something that I feel like God has used in my life to help me. I went back in history over all of my pastors from the time I started into a holiness church, introduced into a holiness church at the age of seven. I went back through history and observed my pastors and their lives. Where they were when I knew them and what they became later in life. Over and over again. Whether I was professing grace or not, over and over again, my heart was sorely disappointed because they had changed and gone another way. I don't think it has to be that way, church. Folk, I don't think it has to be that way. I pray, oh God, help me to be able to get up above it. Help me to be able to keep my attention, my focus on you. When these things are happening all around us, help me to keep my attention on you. Dear Jesus, thank you for your goodness to us. We're so glad that you grant that we can have a pure heart and clean hands. We're glad that you grant that we can walk with you. and We can be victorious. We pray that you'd help us in our movement. Our churches, Lord, where we see so much that's happening all around us, even now, the challenges, Lord, to burden our heart. And we bring them to you, and we wonder sometimes how long before you step on the scene and fix some of those situations that are so devastating among us. And we see pastors and their wives and homes that are being torn asunder, and churches and groups and denominations that are being torn apart, and prisoners and people within our pews that are going other directions. We pray, oh God, you'd send us a revival, an old-fashioned revival, where we'll just be willing to get down on our knees before you and humble our hearts and beg you to forgive us and to heal us and to help us and to cleanse us and to keep us. Be near this, this great conference Encourage and strengthen their hearts. Help them each one, dear God, to stay true to you. We're going home someday soon. Work out your will in our lives. Bless in the camp, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and you're dismissed.